Okay, hello everybody, we're back. Today we're gonna start with an example of function overloading. And essentially what it is, is writing, creating a function with the same name, but with different input arguments. Now the return type makes no difference. So look here, I have three different functions here called foo. Now, this will not work, even though the return types are different. This is void, this is int, and of course I can still modify this thing to return an int. But um, it, this is not an example of um, function overloading. This is going to return a double, so we can go like that. But this isn't going to work. And the reason why it's not going to work is because function overloading is not based upon the return type. It's based on the input arguments. And you notice there are no input arguments in, any, in all three of these. So if I was to try and call this function, if I try and compile this, look what happens. Okay, so it won't, it won't allow me. It says, ambiguating new declaration. So what it says is, you, you can't have the same function name with the same arguments. Then C++ has no way of um, differentiating between them. However, if we change the arguments, so for example, in this one, if we were to accept an int, Okay, and let's say we return, let's say we see out that int. Well, yeah, and then we, we um, you know, it doesn't matter here what we return. It, we can return anything you want. Um, but here, let's cause this to be a double. Now, remember, these don't have to match. In other words, the return type and the input type don't have to match. It's just, just happening by, um, by coincidence here. I can, I can change that. Um, but So in this case, we'll make this a double as well. OK. And we'll see out x here as well, and we'll return 2. So now let's take a look. Does, do each of the functions, um, now in fact, you know, like, let me actually try and make this maybe more clear because all three are different types. So let me make this one void as well. I'm trying to make it possible to determine what actually differentiates them. So notice these two return void, so they don't return anything. But this one accepts nothing. On the other hand, this one accepts an integer. On the other hand, this one accepts a uh, a double. Okay. And in fact, just for fun, you know, let's let's also make this void because I'm changing my mind just just to show you that um, this is going to work. So now let's try compiling and running this, and it works. Notice that it pr it printed zero. Okay. So that means that this one is calling the first one. So it, this is the one that ran. How does it know to call that one when, in fact, there's three functions called foo? And the answer is it's based on what I supplied as input arguments. So as long as the input arguments match, I'm good. In other words, if I was to have two functions with the same input arguments, like that, okay. Even if this is different, let's say this is different now, and I go return, uh, you know, something like that. This will not work. And notice, uh, okay, I get x is not declared in this scope. Uh, that's fine. I can just go see out one, return one, just for fun. Let's just see. It's still gonna fail. And so, it, again, it says ambiguating new declaration of int foo. You can't have 
even though they have different return types, notice this one's returning an int and this one's returning a vo uh, nothing, it doesn't matter because the input types are the same. Now, if I change the input types, if I make this an int, and I was to change this back to void, and I get rid of this uh, return statement here, now we're OK. Because at this point, it, as I said, the return types don't matter. It's what's going in. So if I run this, it works. I get 0 as my output, and there's no errors at all. So and I, can, I can call this function again here. And I can call it again with, um, let's say, a 1. Now that's going to call the second one because 1 is an integer. So I should get 0 for the first one and then 1 for the second one. Let's try it. And, and I do. So that works too. And just for fun, let's call the third iteration uh, foo. And this time, let's send a, a double, 2.0. OK, and so now if I run it again, this should work as well. And it does. So in a nutshell, that is the example of function overloading. In other words, you can supply different data types or different input arguments, not so much different data types. Because the reason I say that is, watch, I can actually do another version of foo. Watch this. So if I was to go void foo, and this time I was to go int x comma int y, notice this time uh, they're both, like these are integers, right? So is this the same as this one? Well, not exactly, because this one has two input uh, arguments, both integers, and so Essentially, now this one is different. OK, let's try it. So foo 3 comma 4. And so if I, if I was to compile this and run it, this should work. And I do. So th that's OK as well. That's different from the other one that only accepts one integer. So there you go. This is function overloading. OK, so um, there's a question in the sense that, you know, would you ever use function overloading? And the answer is actually, I probably you already have. Uh, in the sense that, like, here I've included CMath so I can use uh, square root. And here I'm taking the square root of a integer, and here I'm taking the square root of a float. Now these are different data types being passed to the function. And so therefore, I'd have to have a function with the name sqrt that accepts an integer on this line, and a function named sqrt, same name, but in this case, it would, ha it would have to accept a double or a float. And, and they both work. So if I run this, you can see that, in fact, um, they'll both, they both give me the same answer. And yet, I'm not changing the name of the function. They're both called sqrt. And, it, and interestingly, right, um, if I change this to a 25 and a 25, and I run it again, uh, they, both give, they both end up giving me an integer as the output. So um, the, yeah, but by the way, the return type has nothing to do with overloading it. It's the, it's the input argument that uh, is, is, uh, it's dependent on. OK, so here is a pitfall of function overloading. Uh, if you were to create another function called foo. And this time, 
you went int x. But now you provided a default argument. Okay. Now this is going to cause a problem. Because think about it for a moment. How is the compiler going to figure out which one you mean? So in other words, like look at this one here, which doesn't accept any arguments, and this one, which accepts an integer. But if you don't provide an integer, it's going to default to a value of 9. So if I was to try and compile this, I should get an, amb an ambiguity error. Let's try it. And in fact, I do. OK? Uh, the problem with this is, is that there's no way to tell the difference between these guys. In other words, like in this function call here on line 29, which one am I calling? And, and, and by the way, let me even let me comment this line out. We don't even need this one. We don't need double ambiguity. Like I can take this one out there. So that's, a, that's enough to cause an ambiguity, just these first two. Okay. So now let's try <coughs> compiling it again. And in fact, there you go. It still, it still says um, call overloaded foo is ambiguous. Right? And look at here are the two candidates. It even tells you which one. I don't know which one to choose. That's what, that's what the compiler is saying. It says, do I choose this one or do I choose this one? And so, and by the way, look, it even tells you what line it's on. So if I notice the, the ambiguity comes in on line uh, 30, right? So if you look at line 30, there's the function call foo. Now, are we calling this one or are we calling this one with a default argument? I don't know. Neither does the compiler. So if I, if I try compiling it, notice it says right here, overloaded. Right? There it is, line 30, foo is ambiguous, candidates. These are the two candidates, and I can't choose between them because there's no way for me to know. That's what it's complaining about. So if you're going to use function overloading, be careful about uh, default arguments. Okay? You can create an ambiguity. But the nice thing is, obviously, it's not going to compile. Okay. OK, I'm going to give you a little mini assignment. Write a function called palindrome that will wait for you to type in a, a, a string, you know, uh, like Hannah. And then it will tell you if the palindrome or if the string is a palindrome or is not a palindrome. OK, so dog is not a palindrome. So I want you to write this program, r write palindrome as a function that returns a bool, a Boolean data type, true or false. Go ahead and stop the video or pause the video now. OK, here is my solution to the uh, palindrome function. And I have kind of two solutions here. Um, the first one, I iterate, I, I create an empty string, and then I iterate over the word. This is a uh, C++ string. And I iterate over it forwards through each letter. But when I, reconst when I concatenate to, con to construct the reverse word, notice I add the letter first and then the previous. Uh, parts of the word. So by concatenating in reverse order, I'll end up with the reverse word. And then I simply return true or false by returning whether the reverse word is equal to the original word. Now this equal sign is going to return a true or false, which is exactly what the function should return. It should return a bool. But 
Notice here in my if statement on line 30, I just say if palin w, w being the word that's typed in from the user. Um, in addition, I just thought I'd show this code here is unnecessary, right? You don't need to say if this return true, else return false. Because essentially, I want you to recognize that just saying equals equals comparison operator will return true or false in itself. And that's sufficient. Um, the other alternative solution that I have here, which is commented out, just, just so that you could see it, is essentially I'm concatenating the word in, in a regular way that I would cr uh, create a string with the reverse word at the beginning of the concatenation. But in this case, I'm iterating over the word backwards. OK? Up to you which way you prefer to do it. Both of these will work. And just to show you the, um, the int main, very straightforward. OK. OK, so the next topic that I wanted to hit is um, C++ strings. And so for strings, uh, a good re reference is uh, this website. And um, you can scroll down and see all the different types of, so the, so the iterator methods, the capacity methods, uh, element access, modifiers, and so on. OK? So let's. Um, Let's actually go through some of these. And um, we, obviously, we're not going to learn all of them. But I think it would be nice to learn some. OK, so here is an example of some of the things you can do with uh, C++ strings. I've created, I've instantiated here, or another way of saying created, uh, string s, which is hello world. And now I'm going to use dot find. And notice here I'm including string. Okay. Um, here I'm going to uh, find ll. And so the first obviously index is 0, right? So 0, 1, 2. That's going to give me a 2. So it found ll at 2. So I can, find a, I can find a string, or I can find even a letter. If I do L like that, that'll find that as well. Now, R find is reverse find. It starts looking from the end. And so here, if we start looking for L from here, we find it there. And that is location 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So that's going to give us 9. Um, the other thing which we can do is use substring. Okay. So once again, the, the next one is substring. The first uh, argument says where to start extracting the substring. So location 6, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's the W. And then it says the next argument is how many characters just take starting there. Three, so W O R. Okay? And this one, if string.find xx is equal to string npos, this is true because there is no xx inside hello world. And so now it'll say not found. So in order to test if something is in the string, you know, um, you can do this. String and string and then um, scope resolution NPOS. Okay, which be so NPOS belongs to the uh, string namespace. Um, and uh, or library. 
Anyways, so now the other thing is how to access elements. You can use square brackets just like Python. However, I want you to know that there's no bounds checking with square brackets. Okay? Whereas if you use dot at, there is runtime bound checking. So if you actually try to access something outside of where you're allowed, it'll actually give you a runtime error. Whereas this square bracket might give you a segmentation fault. Okay? So um, we'll continue more on strings next time.